Today we're out here in the forest taking a look at the all new 2017 Kia Sportage. Regular viewers may recall that there is also a first look video on my channel about the 2017 Kia Sportage that was based on a few hours with the car out in the Southern California desert. This video is based on an entire week with the Sportage and in this video we'll be talking about performance scores on our usual test track. We'll be rating this and comparing this with the other crossovers in this particular segment. And we'll also give you much more information about how this stacks up with the rest of the competition. The front end design is instantly recognizable as a Kia. We have the tiger nose grille that we see in a variety of other Kia products, although in a Sportage this looks decidedly hungry compared to some of the other cars in Kia's lineup. Today we are driving the top of the line all wheel drive turbocharged model, so again we do get those very distinctive LEDs right over here. We also have HID headlamps that bend in the corners, and then this other module right here in the middle is sort of an accent light. It's divided into three little sections and you'll see that on each side of the vehicle. Because we're in the all wheel drive model we get a slightly different bumper than the front wheel drive model. You can see here in the picture I'm putting on your screen that the front wheel drive model has sort of a bar style vent right here below the main grille and the front end actually goes a little bit closer to the ground. It's a little bit more blunt. This is a little bit more angled off to give you slightly better approach angles. At 176.4 inches long, the Sportage is one of the smaller entries in this particular segment, but as you'll note by that ruler down there at the bottom of your screen, the Sorento is a decent amount larger than the largest entries in this segment. It's a full 10 inches larger than what we're seeing right here, although it is a full foot shorter than a Ford Explorer. The big difference between the Sportage and the Sorento is right back here in the rear of the vehicle because this is a two-row crossover and the Sorento is available as a three-row crossover. You can actually choose whether you want it two-row or three-row. That means that the Sorento could be seen as either a large two-row upgrade from a RAV4 or CRV or as a smaller three-row option to something like a Ford Explorer. Out back, we have a little bit more style to the Sportage than we see in the average crossover in this segment. We have light pipes that wrap over from the body on over to the trunk lid. We have this red plastic section that helps tie the two modules together, although it's not lit up. Instead of keeping the turn signals up in this module right back here, these are actually just the brake lights and parking lights. The turn signals and backup lights are down here in a separate module. Twin exhaust tips in our model right over here and very well integrated parking sensors. Little backup camera right there below the Kia logo. The Sportage shares two of the engines that we find in the larger Sorento. Things start out with a 2.4 liter four cylinder engine producing 181 horsepower and then we get this optional turbocharged and direct injected engine producing 240 horsepower or 237 horsepower depending on whether you get front wheel drive or all wheel drive. If you're paying attention you'll notice this engine is actually a little bit less powerful than the last generation Sportage's two liter turbo. The reason for that is that Kia has retweaked this engine in order to improve fuel economy and improve drivability. Unfortunately, absolute acceleration does take a little bit of a hit. Both engines are mated to a six-speed automatic transmission and you can get all-wheel drive with either engine. Overall fuel economy lags the most efficient entries in this segment and ranges between 21 miles per gallon for the model we're driving and 26 for the most efficient version. If you feel like towing with your Sportage, the towing capacity comes in at 2,000 pounds, which is fairly average for this particular segment. If you really want to tow in your compact crossover, you should take a look at something like the Jeep Cherokee. It can tow up to 4,500 pounds when properly equipped. One of the reasons that we take a look at vehicles like the Sportage for a full week, even though we've also sampled it at a launch event, is that opinions can change just a little bit after you've had a longer time to spend in the vehicle. Front seat comfort is definitely one of those scores. I'm going to actually drop this down to 7 out of 10 points. We do have a tilt telescopic steering column with a large range of motion, and we have a power driver's seat that offers a two-way adjustable lumbar support, but this seat is not as comfortable as something like a Jeep Cherokee or a Nissan Rogue for long car trips. The overall shape of the seat seems to be the problem for me. The headrest actually bothers me on long car trips and I didn't notice that when we first sampled the vehicle. It sticks out a little bit further forward than I would like and of course you do find four-way adjustable lumbar support in certain trims of the Cherokee. The general seat design in the Rogue is a little bit more comfortable and we get a little bit more thigh support. This is a very competitive segment so don't take this score to mean that this seat is uncomfortable by any stretch. It's just not as comfortable as some. One thing worth noting is that we do have a power front passenger seat. That's something that we don't find in all the competition even in the competition's model with a power driver's seat. Even though the Sportage is one of the smaller entries in this segment, the rear seat is actually among the most comfortable. I have a reasonable amount of room sitting right here behind myself at six feet tall, about three to four inches left there. I also have about an inch of headroom left, even though our model does have the optional panoramic moonroof. The panoramic moonroof is a very nice touch in this segment. It's not that common, and it does extend to just behind my head. In addition to that, the reclined motion of the rear seats has a large range of motion. This is the most reclined position. And then we have a very upright position to help square off that cargo area in the rear. 
The middle seat, the Sportage, is a little bit higher off the ground than the outboard sitting positions, and it's pushed a little bit further forward to help give you a little bit more room for sitting three adults across the back. But even in this position, I still have about half an inch of room left there between my head and the ceiling. Moving all the way over to the right side where I had a six foot five passenger up front, I still have about three inches of leg room left. The rear seats recline in a 60-40 folding fashion and the handle is right here on the side of the rear seat. It folds them almost flat with the cargo area in the rear. Behind the tailgate, you'll find approximately 25% less cargo area than we find in a Toyota RAV4. The RAV4 has an absolutely enormous cargo area in the back. We do have a load floor that moves into two different ways. There is a very low position. We can actually pull it out and reinsert it at a position that's approximately three inches higher. When you do that, you can lift it up and then put additional cargo hidden beneath the load floor. Let's take a look at that load floor from a different angle. Again, we just pull it out, let it fall right there into its next position and then slide it in and then it latches back into place. You notice that this back end kicks up just a little bit and that's due to the overall shape of the vehicle. When it comes to our new roller bag test, this cargo area scores very well. You are able to actually put six of these 24 inch roller bags back here in the cargo area and still close the hatch. Now the bags do touch the glass right here at this point. And you could squeeze perhaps a little bit more if you were to push those front seats just a little bit more into an upright position. They're in a relatively comfortable angle at the moment, and the cargo area load floor is at its lowest point. When it comes to our exclusive trunk comfort index, I'm going to give this 7 out of 10 points. We find less room than we find in some of the larger entries in this segment, but interestingly enough, you'll find more than you find in the Jeep Cherokee. We have this two-position cargo area load floor, but we don't find any convenient shopping bag holders in the rear like you do see in some of those other options out there. Taking a quick spin around the interior, you can see how large that panoramic moonroof is. It goes right back there to just over the rear passenger's heads. From this angle, you can see again those headrests that I said earlier stick out a little bit further forward than I would like, and we have height adjustable seat belts for both the driver and the front passenger. Because we're in the top end trim, we have leather seats. These are ventilated as well as heated, and we have a perforated section right there in the center of the seat. Moving on over to the front door panels, these are mostly soft touch plastic. So we actually have soft touch in this upper portion here, center section, and of course a soft touch armrest, but you will find hard plastics lower on the door panels, especially around this bottle holder. The dashboard is a soft touch injection molded part that's then been after stitched to give this the impression of multiple pieces of material, but this is just a classic injection molded part. We then have hard plastics lower, and then we have a large bin style glove compartment. I was able to fit a small tablet computer inside, but not a large one. In the center of the dashboard, we have two large air vents with closure knobs, and the overall style is a little reminiscent of the grill that we find on the front of most modern Kias. You'll notice that we also have Apple CarPlay and Android Auto in our top end model with the optional touchscreen navigation system. Below the infotainment and navigation screen, we find the SD card slot for the mapping database. We also have the direct access buttons for the various features and functions in the system, radio, media, phone, map, UVO, and setup over there. We have a keyless go start button right over here dual zone climate control, and then we find the controls for the ventilated, heated seats, and the heated steering wheel right below that. As we see in other Kia models, the single USB port for attaching a smartphone or other USB media device is right here below those controls. We have an auxiliary input as well, and two 12 volt power ports on either side. The shifter is a traditional console design, drives all the way back towards the driver, manual mode over to the left, up for up and down for down. Below that, you'll find a variety of different buttons for the drive mode selection. This allows you to toggle between eco, sport, and regular, hill descent control, a button to manually lock the center coupling in the all-wheel drive system, and a parking sensor enable and disable button. We also have two large cup holders that don't have a cover. Between the front seats, we have a softly padded center armrest that opens to reveal a storage cubby that's moderately sized but does not have any USB or 12-volt power ports in it like we do find in some of the competition. The instrument cluster is very similar to other Kia models. We have a large tachometer on the left, a large speedometer on the right, black faces, white numbers, and red needles. Our model also has this color multi-information display between the two gauges. This is where you'll find things like vehicle settings. We also have our trip computer information, turn-by-turn -turn navigation if you have that option, the status of our safety systems, media systems, and of course, the service intervals for the vehicle. The steering wheel design is reminiscent of certain Audi steering wheels. We have a flat bottom, sport grips right up top, perforated sections of leather on each side. On the left side of the steering wheel, we find dedicated phone hang up and pick up buttons, volume toggle with mute right there in the center, track forward, backward, mode button, and voice command button. On the right side of the steering wheel, we find the cruise control buttons, and then this button and this toggle control the multifunction display between the speedometer and the tachometer. 
Because we're in the top end SX trim, we have shift paddles on the back of the steering wheel. We have up on the right and down on the left, and they do move with the steering wheel. Temperature and altitude affect the zero to 60 time of any vehicle out there, whether it's turbocharged, naturally aspirated V6, V8, four cylinder, whatever. And that's part of the reason why we tend to prefer to test vehicles zero to 60 on our own home turf, because this vehicle ran from zero to 60 in 6.7 seconds on the same track at about the same temperature as every other vehicle that we test out there. And at the launch event, we only got 7.5 seconds, likely because it was a hot day and we were at altitude. Of course, the 2012 Sportage Turbo that we tested once upon a time ran from zero to 60 about a half second faster than this vehicle. That is because, again, it had a more powerful four-cylinder engine. Although this Sportage is slower than the previous Sportage Turbo, it has a more usable torque curve, which means that as we're climbing up this hill right here, I can actually have it in for instance, sixth gear and still climb this hill and accelerate up the hill. And you weren't able to do that in the previous Sportage at such low RPM. So it actually helps improve both the real world driving ability of this vehicle and the real world fuel economy. As you'd expect from a name like Sportage, this Kia is one of the sportiest entries in this segment. But sporty can mean something different to various people. This is unquestionably one of the faster entries in this segment. It also stops one of the shortest. 120 feet from 60 to zero is what we scored. That's definitely short than the CRV, the RAV4, even the Mazda CX-5. When I say that sporty can mean different things to different people, it's not always about absolute grip numbers, acceleration numbers, braking numbers. A lot of it comes down to feel. And that's where things are a little bit different for the Sportage, because this does not feel quite as engaging as a Mazda CX-5, even though it accelerates faster than any CX-5, brakes shorter than any CX-5, and arguably holds the road better than any CX-5 as well. It's mainly the steering. The steering just doesn't feel quite as communicative. It's much harder to tell what the front tires are doing. And of course, they have that usual numb feeling that we get out of any electric power steering system. But again, this vehicle holds the road just about as well or better than any CX-5, stops shorter, accelerates faster. So what does Sporty mean to you? Let me know down there in the comments section down below. The design of this all-wheel drive system is one of the reasons that the Sportage feels so nimble out on the road. It's kind of an interesting system because, of course, we have the ability to manually lock the center coupling. Of course, this doesn't appear to be a 100% full lock like we do see in some of the entries because otherwise we would actually feel the wheels binding a little bit in tight corners. But it is a very near full lock and it will definitely fully lock when it needs to. So if you engage the lock mode and, for instance, you're on a very loose, sandy, or gravelly surface and you just floor the car, it's instantly sending power to the rear wheels. The all-wheel drive software also offers a predictive mode, which tries to determine when you're going to need power to the rear, even though the rear wheels have not slipped yet. That's definitely obvious out here on winding mountain roads, where if you start in a corner and then you to apply power while you're in the corner, you can really feel the power shifting to the rear of the vehicle. And you can actually get the rear end of the Sportage to kick out just a little bit under the right circumstances. This is never going to feel like a rear wheel drive biased vehicle, but it does feel like a vehicle with a very aggressive all-wheel drive system. Although the Sportage has a fairly firm suspension out on gravel roads like this, the suspension still soaks up bumps with reasonable ability. This doesn't feel as overly firm as some of the luxury sports crossovers that we see out there, so this is not going to feel like a BMW X3 M Sport or anything along those lines. That said, you will still find a more compliant ride in something like a Cherokee, a CRV, or a RAV4. The RAV4 is particularly soft in this segment. When it comes to cabin noise, I'm going to give this an A. This is easily one of the quietest cabins in this segment. We scored 70 decibels at 50 miles an hour. Keep in mind that we are in the top end trim with the widest tires available, and tire width does play a role when it comes to the cabin noise. Fuel economy is an area where Kia has traditionally lagged the competition, and the Sportage is no different. Keep in mind that we are again in the top end model with the turbocharged engine, all wheel drive, and those wider tires, but we've been averaging about 21 to 21 and a half miles per gallon. So I'm gonna have to give this a C plus. The reason for that is if you were to get, for instance, a V6 Jeep Cherokee, it would actually go zero to 60 faster than this and give you slightly better fuel economy, especially in a comparably equipped model. You'll find notably better fuel economy in something like a Mazda CX-5, Honda CR-V, Nissan Rogue, or even certain versions of the Toyota RAV4. The overall feel of the Sportage is very European, very Germanic. This actually reminds me an awful lot of something like an Audi Q3. Pricing and value have long been a Kia strong suit, and that continues for the Sportage, although it is not quite as low priced as it was in the past. The LX model starts at $22,990, but it does come with a great deal of standard equipment that you don't find in many of the competition. The backup camera is standard, as is the 5-inch touchscreen infotainment system, and we get fairly wide tires on alloy wheels. These are 225 width tires standard 
on all models except for the SX Turbo, which actually gets wider tires, some of the widest tires in this segment. Those wide tires are important when we start talking about the comparisons later in this video, because the wider the tires, generally, the better the road holding. The first option package available on the LX trim is $1,100, and it gives you the features that you see in the yellow over here under the EX trim. Things like the roof rails, the solar control glass, and most importantly, the power driver's seat with power adjustable lumbar support. That means this is one of the least expensive entries in this segment with a power adjustable seat and power lumbar support that definitely made it more comfortable for my back. If you add an additional $900 package to that LX model, which would bring your total MSRP out the door to $24,990 before destination, then you add on two zone climate control and the larger seven inch color touchscreen infotainment system, which does include Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. All of those features and leather seats with keyless entry and keyless go are standard in the EX trim for $25,500. That makes the EX trim of the Sportage the least expensive vehicle in this segment to get leather upholstery. So if all you really want are things like CarPlay, Android Auto, and leather upholstery and a touchscreen infotainment system and two zone climate control with a power driver's seat, basically comfort and some of those luxury touches, the EX trim is going to be a very, very good value in this segment. Of course, if you want more doodads, you can add them with the premium package or the premium and tech package on the EX trim. And when we take a look at the feature comparison list, you'll notice that there isn't too much of a difference between a fully decked out EX trim and the SX Turbo. The biggest difference, of course, would be that two liter turbocharged engine, which is much more powerful, the xenon headlamps, the LED fog lamps, dual exhaust, the slightly different sport wheel we were taking a look at, and those wider tires. All the prices you're looking at on this screen are the front wheel drive prices. You can add all wheel drive to either engine choice. Before we dive right into comparisons, I should say that we will only be comparing the Sportage to the top four entries in this particular segment. There are so many compact crossovers available in America and more coming every day that we just don't have the time in one video to compare every entry to every other entry. At $24,910 starting, the Toyota RAV4 is definitely more expensive than the base LX trim of the Sportage. And the LX actually comes with a bit more standard equipment than we find in the RAV4. Although Toyota has a very well-deserved reputation for reliability, and that translates right on into the RAV4, you'll actually find a longer warranty in the Kia Sportage. One thing you won't find in the Kia Sportage, however, is an enormous cargo area. And the RAV4 is a little bit less comfortable, it's a little bit less sporty, it's not quite as fast, I don't think it's quite as good looking either, but it does have an absolutely enormous trunk. Not only is the trunk in the RAV4 large and accommodating, but the entry level height in the RAV4's trunk is very, very low. That means it's much easier to put large and heavy things into the back of the RAV4. Now on the downside, it's not going to be quite as much fun to drive. And it's not necessarily going to be that much more fuel efficient than the Sportage either. Fuel economy in the RAV4 and the Sportage are both a little bit lower than the really efficient entries in this segment. That's because you won't find CVTs under this hood or small displacement turbocharged engines in order to help improve efficiency. On the plus side for the RAV4, they do have a new hybrid model, and that hybrid model is one of the most efficient entries in this particular segment, although the 2017 Nissan Rogue Hybrid will actually beat it in terms of fuel economy. On the plus side for Kia is the new SX Turbo trim that we were testing this week. It is definitely one of the faster entries in this particular segment. It also is one of the sportiest and best handling entries. Honda has priced the CRV very aggressively for this model year. At $23,845, it comes fairly close to the Sportage until you start taking a look at the level of standard equipment. You will find more equipment in the base LX trim of the Sportage than the base trim of the Honda CRV. Honda's CRV seems very targeted at family friendliness, high cargo capacity, and high fuel economy, whereas the Sportage really seems to be targeting a more engaging driving experience. It definitely handles better, it feels a little bit more engaging out on the road, and of course we get more standard feature equipment for the price. As you start working your way up the ladder as far as pricing and options are concerned, you'll definitely find better value over here in the Kia Sportage. You'll also again find a longer warranty. As with the RAV4, we don't find a larger or more powerful engine option in the CRV, so there's really no direct corollary to the SX Turbo. Ford's Escape at $23,600 
has one of the lower starting prices in this segment, although you don't get the same engine that you find in most of the 40 escapes on the dealer lot. It seems that most of the escapes in the dealer lot will have a 1.6 liter turbocharged engine that I actually find a little bit better than the base engine that we find in the Kia Sportage. However, for that same base price, you will find the older 2.5 liter four-cylinder engine in the 40 Escape. And the engine that we see in the Kia Sportage actually gives a slightly better fuel economy and slightly better performance in real-world driving than the 2.5 liter four-cylinder that we see in the Escape. One of the main selling points with the Escape is the amount of customization that you can do with the car. There are three different engine options available, and there are a lot of standalone options and standalone features that you can select. That's not what we see in the Kia Sportage. Kia, very much like the Japanese car companies, has really coalesced things into dedicated trim levels with a few option packages available. That means that there's a little bit less variety going on in the Sportage, but it also helps them keep prices low because even though the Kia Sportage and the Ford Escape seem very similarly priced, especially in the base and mid-level trims, you'll find definitely more feature content in the Kia than you will find in the Ford. And yet again, we do have a longer warranty. Now the Escape fights back with an excellent handling dynamic, but when we actually take a look at the SX turbo trim of the Sportage, I think it beats the Ford Escape in terms of overall handling. The Ford Escape has a slightly better steering feel to it. However, the Sportage actually grips the road just a little bit better. I also like the way the all-wheel drive system works in the SX turbo versus the top end trims of the Ford Escape Titanium. Speaking of the Ford Escape Titanium, it will set you back about $4,000 more than a comparably equipped Kia Sportage SX Turbo. Although you can get that same 2.0-liter 4-cylinder engine in the lower-end SE trim of the Escape, it's not comparably equipped to what we see in the SX Turbo. If all you're after is a 2.0-liter turbo in your crossover, then the Escape SE with the 2.0-liter turbo will be one of the least expensive options in this segment, but you're not going to get all the same goodies and gadgets that we find in the Sportage for a comparable price. The Nissan Rogue has been one of the least expensive entries in this segment, but we don't know what the 2017 Rogue will be priced like. We will have a video on the 2017 Nissan Rogue coming up very soon, but until we know what the pricing is going to be like with the 2017 Rogue, comparisons are a little bit tricky. So we're going to just assume that the 2017 Rogue ends up only a few hundred dollars more than the 2016 Nissan Rogue. In terms of standard feature content, the two models compare fairly well, although you will still find more feature content in the Kia Sportage for that base price of $22,990. Being one of the larger entries in this segment, you will not only find more cargo space in the Nissan Rogue, but you'll also find this segment's only third row option. That third row in the Rogue is very compact. It's sort of the emergency backseat or the mother-in-law backseat, but it does have one, and it means that as far as passenger versatility goes, the Rogue beats all the other options in this segment. Thanks to the overall size of the Nissan, you'll also find more room in the back seat for adults, for children, or more importantly, for car seats than you find in the smaller entries in this segment. And remember, the Sportage is on the smaller end of this segment. The fuel economy for the Rogue is very high for this particular segment, and there is an all-new hybrid model for 2017. On the flip side of things, Nissan has sacrificed a great deal in terms of handling and performance in order to get you that high fuel economy. So the way the Sportage drives is going to be much more engaging than anything that Nissan has over there in the Rogue. Although Nissan's pricing has traditionally been very aggressive, you'll find leather in the Kia Sportage about $3,000 less than the Nissan Rogue. You'll also find Apple CarPlay and Android Auto support inside the Kia Sportage at that $25,500 price point, but you won't find it at any price in the Rogue at this time. Now let's talk about the SX Turbo in a little bit greater detail. Most entries in this segment have abandoned their optional V6 engines, but in that process, not every manufacturer decided to include a higher horsepower turbocharged engine to replace the V6 engine. The biggest seller in this segment that offers a higher horsepower engine, of course, is the Ford Escape that we just talked about a little bit earlier. Comparably equipped, it's going to be more expensive than an SX Turbo because you do have to take a look at that top end titanium trim in order to compare feature for feature. For the same feature set that we find in the SX Turbo, the Forester XT will set you back about $4,000 more. Of course, you have to get all-wheel drive in the Forester because it is standard in all Subaru models except for the BRZ, and on the SX Turbo side, you can actually get it in front-wheel drive trim if you don't want to spend the money on the all-wheel drive system or if you want to save a little bit in terms of your fuel economy. The continuously variable transmission in the Subaru allows it to go from 0 to 60 faster than we see in the Kia Sportage. However, it also means it's not going to be quite as engaging to drive as the Sportage. 
Not only does the Forester have a slightly less engaging feel, it also won't hold the road quite as well as the Sportage either. In terms of all-wheel drive system design, the two are actually a little bit closer than they have been in the past. As far as higher horsepower engine options go, there is also the Jeep Cherokee because it is available with a 3.2 liter V6 engine. It's one of the only entries in this segment that still offers a V6. Of course, that V6 is mated to ZF's 9-speed automatic transmission, which isn't the smoothest transmission in the world. The Cherokee also has a very different mission than the one that we see in the Sportage. The Sportage is very on-road focused. The Cherokee is very off-road focused. As far as upper-end trims go, the Cherokee is one of the better values in this segment because it's only a little bit more than the SX Turbo, but you're likely to get a better deal on it at the Jeep dealer. The other unique thing about the Cherokee is the wider variety of luxury features that you can get in your model. If you want things like a stitched leather dashboard, radar adaptive cruise control, those are available on the Cherokee, but you won't find them in most of the other entries. My bottom line with the Sportage is that this is definitely one of my favorite entries in this segment. On the downside, however, the Sportage is on the smaller end of the segment. So if you're really looking for something that has a large cargo area, then you're going to have to look elsewhere. But if you're just looking for one of the more fun entries in this segment or one of the better values in this segment, the Sportage definitely should be on your list. My top pick in this segment is the 2017 Kia Sportage, especially in EX trim, and my runner-up would be the all-new 2017 Nissan Rogue. The Nissan Rogue is very family-focused, it also is an incredible value, with very good fuel economy and that enormous cargo area in the back. I would also definitely take a look at that Rogue in the seven-passenger trim version, even if you don't think you're going to use them very often. They're just very handy to have around. The all-new 2018 Chevy Equinox looks like a video that you really need to keep a close eye on in this segment because General Motors looks like they're going to be very, very aggressive, not only with the pricing, but most importantly, the feature set in that all-new Equinox. It's also going to be the only option in this segment with a small diesel engine, which should give you class-leading fuel economy if you're willing to do diesel instead of a hybrid. In addition to all of that, it looks like GM is going to be very aggressive in putting a lot of feature content in their lower end trims. Until that time, I'm Alex Dykes and this has been the 2017 Kia Sportage. Be sure and check out those related videos on the side of your screen. Click that subscribe button down there at the bottom of the screen and I'll see you next week.